Well, good morning, everybody. I invite you to take up God's Word and turn with me to Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10, if you're using one of the Pew Bibles, this can be found on page 7. Genesis chapter 10. Uh, You know, our theology has a way of shaping the way that we live. You know, what we believe always has an effect on what we do. And if we do something that contradicts what we believe, there's a very good chance that maybe we don't actually believe that thing. So in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, listen to what God says about His Word. All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable. That means that every line found in this Bible right here is divinely inspired and is divinely beneficial for God's people. That's the theology. Now, look down at your Bible in front of you. Look at Genesis chapter 10. What you see before you is a long long chapter filled with a bunch of names that are really difficult to pronounce and at first glance may not seem terribly relevant to your Christian life. And so I confess in our series through Genesis, I actually toyed with the idea of just skimming through this chapter, maybe even just reading a few parts of it. Uh, But then I remembered that what we believe needs to shape what we do. And I say I believe that every single word of the Bible is inspired by God and is edifying for God's people. So I would be somewhat of a hypocrite if I decided to play God's editor and said, well, let's just skip over these parts. That's boring. That's not essential. No need to even worry ourselves with that. God doesn't need an editor. God has, my job is not to pick and choose which parts of God's word are worth spending time over. My job is just to proclaim it and let God get all the glory. So what we're going to do, brace yourselves, we're going to read through this entire chapter, 32 verses of linguistic glory. All right, so... Follow along with me. Look at Genesis chapter 10. Let's start in verse 1. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Medai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togarma. The sons of Javan, Elishash, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. From these, the coastland people spread to their lands, each with his own language, by their clans in their nations. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Seba, Havilah, Sabta, Rama, and Sabtika. The sons of Rama, Sheba, and Dadan. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Echad, and Kalnech in the land of Shinar. From that land he went into Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth Ir, Kelah, and Resen between Nineveh and Kelah. That is the great city. Egypt fathered Ludim, Anamim, Lehabimim, Naphtuhim, Pathrusim, Kasluhim, from whom the Philistines came, and Kaphtorim. Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Arvadites, the Zemorites, the Hamathites. Afterward, the clans of the Canaanites dispersed, and the territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar as far as Gaza, and in the direction of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. Everybody with me so far? All right, home stretch here. To Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arkpashad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram, Uz, Hul, Gether, and Mash. Arkpashad fathered Shelah, and Shelah fathered Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his day the earth was divided. And his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan fathered Almadad, Shelef, Hazarmaveth, Jera, Hadorim, Uzal, Dikla, Omal, Abimal, Sheba, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab. All of these were the sons of Joktan. The territory in which they lived extended from Misha in the direction of Sephar to the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. These are the clans of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies, in their nations, and from these, the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. Amen, we're done for the day. 
No, let's, uh, let's go ahead and pray and ask for God's help this morning. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you've given us every single line that we just read. We know it's from you. We know it's intended to bring glory to you. And we know that it is for our edification in Jesus Christ. I pray and ask, O oh Lord, that you would give us wisdom and discernment and understanding so that we would hear and believe and apply all that you have spoken. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible, as we've discussed, is one coherent story. Sometimes we segregate it up into little standalone stories. You know, here's Adam and Eve here, there's David and Goliath there, Daniel and the lions here, and we make them all just uh, almost like a, a, an account of the, the Grimm's fairy tales. They all have no connection to each other. They're just kind of cute little life lessons for us to go by. But the Bible is one coherent narrative. From Genesis through Revelation, God is telling a big story. Now, maybe you can think back to someone you know, maybe someone very recently, who has told you a story, and that story was just so chock full of rabbit trails and diversions and useless, irrelevant information. You're fine with listening to a story, but sheesh, it's just so overbloated with details. You don't even know where they're going with this. It's like they're making it up on the spot. They're not even staying on track anymore, and you're totally lost. You don't know what these details have to do with the story they're trying to tell. It's totally nothing to do with the plot. But a good storyteller, someone who knows how to tell a good narrative, every detail is important. Every jot and tittle that is included has a purpose. There are no throwaway words. There's no pointless characters. There's no unnecessary descriptions. And there's no dead-end plots. Every sentence should be a beautiful and critical thread in the tapestry of this story. And this chapter that we've just read, guys, for as tedious as it might seem, it actually serves a very important role in the big story God is telling. And it actually conveys to us some really important information about that story. If we would have open eyes, and let's just not just search it for some quick, inspiring quote, or we may read a whole chapter and we have the one little half a verse that, oh, that's inspiring and leave. No, let's try to, let's try to understand the mind of the author. Why did God choose to include this in this big story? And may he show us by the wisdom and light of his Holy Spirit its significance. So there's several things I think we can get out of this, the ways in which this is important for our story. So here's the first thing. Let's, let's look at a couple things about God's big story. First of all, God's big story is all about God. Now, what we have just read in this account is how of Noah's three sons, they all had sons, and all these people spread out and distributed around the world. They filled the globe, and they established and cultivated their own communities, their own nations, their own groups. But as fallen man, because remember, there's always that sin problem, and so it's not just people covering the globe, it's sinful people. And as they go to their different geographical locales, what ends up happening is they end up developing these false views about God. And this is how we have such a diversity of false religions in the world. As these people spread out, they bring with them these wrong ideas about God. And one of the most prominent religious ideas that filled the ancient world was what's called polytheism. Polytheism is the belief in many gods. Monotheism is one god. Polytheism is many gods. But what's interesting about this is that if, let's say, I'm group A over here in the mountains and you're group B over here in the woods, I have my collection of gods, you have your collection of gods, I don't disbelieve in your gods. I just think they're your local gods for over there in the woods. Whereas my gods here in the mountains, they're, they're limited to my locale. So there could be an infinite number of gods. Who knew? You know, there, there were gods of the mountains, gods of the plains, gods of the hills, gods of, of the waters. There was gods of fertility. There was gods of the crops. There, there was gods for everything. And so the, the gods, there was no uppercase G god who ruled over everything. It was just an infinite number of lowercase g gods who happened to reign over these different uh, terrains and parts of, of the world. And, and we see this on display. There's a story that's told in 1 Kings chapter 20. In 1 Kings chapter 20, the king of Syria leads a coalition of 32 other kings in battle against Israel. Now, this looks like it should be a slaughter. You've got a total of 33 kings going against one king. Israel should get obliterated off the map, easy peasy. 
but it doesn't happen. There's this battle that happens in the hills, and Israel ends up routing this coalition and chases them away. How did that happen? Well, the king of Syria's advisors come to him, and they say, oh, we made a miscalculation. You see, Israel's God is the God of the hills. That's where he dwells. We fought them in the hills. Naturally, we lost. Now, let's try fighting them next time in the plains. Their God can't help them there. Their God is stuck in the hills. If we fight them in the plains, we'll beat them this time. And so they try it. And you know what happens? God scoffs at such a notion. God sends a prophet to basically mock them. In verse 28, he says, it says, A man of God came near and said to the king of Israel, Thus says the Lord, Because the Syrians have said, The Lord is a God of the hills and not a God of the valleys, Therefore, I'll give this great multitude into your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. That is, I'm not limited to the hills or the valleys or the waterfalls. I am God. I am Lord of all. And what we see here in Genesis 10 is that as these nations are divided and as they're scattered across the globe, they do so, all of them, under the sovereignty and the supremacy of the one true God of the cosmos. He is not a localized God of one region, but the universal God of all the earth. And we're going to see this. So there's a character here who gets a good bit of attention, if you notice that, by the name of Nimrod. Nimrod, we're actually going to talk more about next week. Because as we read, Nimrod was actually the founder of the city of Babel, which is what we're going to talk about next week in Genesis 11. So I'm going to wait and focus more on Nimrod next week when we come to Babel. But I think it's important. Nimrod is not a good dude. His name means rebellion. He was, I think, kind of the first tyrannical human ruler. And yet even Nimrod, it tells us, look what it says. Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Even this mighty, tyrannical ruler who thinks he's got the world under his thumb is himself subject to the Lord of all, because all of them are under God's supremacy. That's why Psalm 47, verses 7 and 8 says, For God is the king of all the earth. God reigns over the nations. This big story that includes all the world is ultimately about and under the lordship of the one true God. You need to understand that. Here's the second thing, though. God's big story, let's pull up point number two. God's big story is real history. Now, this section we've just read in Genesis 10, this is commonly referred to as the table of nations, kind of like a table of contents. You know, if you were to open up the front page of a book and your table of contents tells you everything that's there, everything that's within the book. And so this table of nations gives us kind of a layout of which nations were accounted for, which nations were present in the world that identifies who they were, where they came from. In fact, this is not simply a genealogy of individuals. We saw that in Genesis 4 and 5. Those were genealogies of individuals. This is primarily a genealogy of nations. This is primarily concerned with where all the different people groups of the world came from. And I, you can actually trace all of the nations, all the people groups in the world, back to these three sons of Noah. We don't have time to dig into it too much, but I encourage you to go and study this. It's really fascinating. In verses 2 through 5, we read about the descendants of Japheth. And it's believed that from Japheth came the people of India, the people of Europe, probably a good portion of the people in East Asia, and by extension, the people who then immigrated over the Bering Strait and filled North and South America. So they all came from Japheth. Ham, who is covered in verses 6 through 20, he is to believe, the father, to believe to be the father of the people who lived in Africa and parts of Asia. And Shem, who's covered in verses 21 through 31, his descendants are the Middle Eastern people. And so all these various people groups that filled the world can be traced back to these three sons. And in fact, there's some really interesting linguistic connections here too. So if you look at the names of some of these people, you can actually follow the development of these names historically into different people groups, some of which are still around today. So for example, verse 2 talks about this guy named Gomer. And there's kind of a long and complicated history there, but that eventually gives rise to the name Germany. So the name Germany, you can actually trace its roots back to this name Gomer. Madai in verse 2, he is the ancestor of the Medes, and you can see the similar wording there. Madai is the ancestor of the, uh, or the, yeah, the ancestor of the Medes, as in the Medes and Persians. Verse 2, you see Javan, who he came to be known as Yevan, or also Ionian, which was a term used of the Greek people. 
and Javan's son Elishash led to the formation of the word Hellas, which was another term referencing the Greeks. So I know this is a lot of linguistic technicalities, but if, if you have time to go and research it more, it's really fascinating. You can trace some of these men and the names that get carried over into the people groups they establish. In fact, look at verse 6. It talks about Noah's son, Ham. Ham is a name that actually means hot or black. And it tells us here that his descendants end up settling in Africa. And so it's often assumed children are normally given names with significance to them. It's assumed that Ham is named black because his skin is a darker shade. And so it's believed that his descendants who settled in Africa then had this same darker complexion that he did. The name Shem is where we get the term Semitic. So you might refer to Middle Eastern people as Semitic people because they are all descended from Shem. Shem's son Asher in verse 22 is where you get the word Assyrians. And I don't want to bore you with too many of these details. It, it really is fascinating, but there's a really important one here too. Look at verse 24. We read about this man named Eber, E-B-E-R. His name is where we get the word Hebrews from. And as we'll see, Eber is the father of the Hebrew people. He's Abraham's forefather. Now, all of this is so unique in ancient history. When you, I'm a history guy, I find it really fascinating. When you study ancient literature and you study the genealogies and accounts that ancient people had, what you will find is they'll have genealogies of their kings and they may have genealogies of some of their own people, but you do not find anywhere else in antiquity an extended genealogical list of other nations that are out there. Israel is unique in that they possessed this list of all the other nations and where they came from. And so this led William Foxwell Allwright. He was an, archaeolo an archaeologist and ancient scholar in the 20th century. Listen to what he says. The 10th chapter of Genesis stands absolutely alone in ancient literature without a remote parallel. The table of nations remains an astonishingly accurate document. What this means is that what we're reading here is not just myths. These are not Greek myths about Zeus and Hermes or anything like that. These are real people and events that played out and guess what? Are still playing out in space and time. You know what this tells me? That God's story is not a bedtime story. It's not a fairy tale. It's real history that God is working in space, in time, and we are a part of that story right now. It was real in the past. It's ongoing now we live in this same world we are the inheritors of the same people groups and the story is ongoing it's real third thing is this god's big story is written and directed by god there's a lot of people groups here moving into a lot of different places now with this many groups moving in so many different spots all around the globe developing these countlessly unique cultures the whole thing at first kind of looks like a random explosion like just, there go all the people. No rhyme, rhythm, or reason to it. It reminded me of a couple of years ago when our oldest son, William, he was probably a baby, maybe a year old, and Trina was in the kitchen making waffles one Saturday morning for breakfast, and she likes to boil the syrup, make it piping hot before you, you, you pour it over the waffles, and she kind of forgot it was on the burner. So I'm in the other room, and I just hear an explosion and Trina screaming, and I come running into the kitchen, and she had left the syrup on for too long, and it exploded everywhere. And so there is syrup splattered all over the walls, on the ceiling, under the cabinets, on poor Trina, and one-year-old William is sitting there just laughing his little head off. He just thought it was hilarious. But I say that because now four years later, we still find chunks of syrup stuck underneath parts of the cabinet. It was just this random, there was no control or reason to how all those little parts ended up flung all over the kitchen. But that's not what happened here. People are not just randomly dispersing. God is actually sovereignly presiding over where all these people reside. Let's pull up, we have a Bible verse here from Acts chapter 17, verse 26. This is the Apostle Paul preaching in Athens, duking it out with the Athenian philosophers. He says that God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. See what Paul says here? All humanity, 
comes back to this one person. We have these same ancestors, and it says it was God who determined the boundaries and where they were to live. That is, the dispersing and allotting of nations was orchestrated by God. As the writer, as the director, as the sovereign one over this story, he's putting all the pieces in place. God is setting up the chessboard exactly the way he wants it. God is directing everything that goes on here. And I think we should note that Genesis 10, Genesis 11, and Genesis 12 all come as a package deal. Genesis 10 shows us the what. It shows us that the people disperse. Next week in Genesis 11, we're going to read why. Why did they disperse? We're going to zoom in the microscope and examine the story of the Tower of Babel. But then with all of those nations now in place and with mankind scattered and divided all over, in Genesis chapter 12, God is going to pick out this man, Abraham, and he designates a special blessing to Abraham and his family and says, Abraham, through your offspring, all the nations of the world will be blessed. All the nations have been put into position by God, and now through Abraham's offspring, that blessing will also spread to the far corners of the world. So God is setting up the board exactly the way he wants it. Fourthly, God's big story. It provides us with our own proper context. If you know me, you know that I fall asleep pretty easily. In fact, I've fallen asleep in some really awkward circumstances before. I've fallen asleep at parties. I've fallen asleep in restaurants. I fell asleep riding It's a Small World at Disney World. I've fallen asleep in just two-minute car rides. I've fallen asleep while working out. I even fell asleep parked at a red light one time. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm borderline narcoleptic. But I've also fallen asleep in the middle of almost every movie I've ever attempted to watch. And you know what happens is when the movie first starts, I'm feeling good. Like, here's the, the opening credits. Yeah, I'm pumped. Let's do it. I can't wait to finally see this film. Uh, I'm ready for it. But then you know what happens? Oh, the chair just feels And my eyelids just start feeling so heavy. And I just start dozing off. And then I'm off in dreamland. And Trina's watching the movie by herself. But you know what happens? Usually about halfway through the movie, my eyes snap open. I'm like, duh, duh, and I'm trying to get back into the movie. But by now, I'm totally lost. I have no idea who anybody is. I don't know what's happening. I don't know why there's this explosion. I don't know why this person is crying. I'm very confused about what's going on. Why? Because I have no context for understanding what's going on in the story. If I just start at the beginning and then jump right into the middle, I don't know what's going on in the story. I can see what's happening on the screen, but I can't tell you its significance. I, I can't connect the dots. How did I get from what I saw in the opening scene to where we are right now? I, I don't have that bridge that connects the two for me. Well, we know from Genesis 6 through 9 that Noah and his family come out of the ark. And we know that later in the Bible, we're going to have the Israelites living in Canaan, surrounded by all these other nations. And we're going to have Jesus later on telling his disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. But how do you get from one to the other? How do you get from this one man with his three sons to suddenly an entire populated globe? It's almost like if you fall asleep, you're going to miss it. If you doze off, you're not going to understand how do we get from one little group of people to now a planet full of people? Where did these Jebusites and Amorites and Hivites all come from? Where did we come from? And so Genesis 10 and 11 serve as a sort of bridge for us. That They connect the dots, how you get from the beginning of Genesis to later on in the story. To miss out on this would be like falling asleep in a movie. Now, in a similar way, when we understand that we are a part of God's story, when we understand that God is the one authoring and weaving this great big tale of history, you know what that does? That helps us make better sense of our own context. It helps us understand why we are here. It helps us understand what we are meant to do. Who am I? What is my purpose in life? What is my significance? In order to understand what's going on here in Genesis, you have to always understand the context of why it's happening. And in order to understand our own lives, we can only do that by understanding ourselves in the context of God's big story. Now, what this should do is this should make us both humble and it should make us confident. It should make us humble because we realize 
I'm not the center of this story. I am not living my own life for my glory. I am not just an autonomous island floating around in time and space, free to carve my destiny and, and be whatever I want to be. I'm here for a purpose. I'm here playing a role in God's good story. That's deeply humbling to me. But that should also be extremely, uh, it should make us extremely confident as well. Why? Because now I don't have to try to create my own meaning. I don't have to try to look at just how vast the world is and say, what's my purpose? God already has it. So I can go out and I can live my life boldly for God, knowing it matters, knowing it's significant, because God is using it to write a vital part of his story. And so when, when we understand our context properly, it can only be done by understanding it's a part of God's story. Fifthly, God's story is bigger than you think. Bigger than you think. Imagine with me for a moment that you're a member of ancient Israel. You're one of the first readers who gets this. Moses writes it, and you read it for the first time. You might assume that this story is all about you. You might assume that the end-all, be-all of God's story is just the nation of Israel. But God does not simply provide a genealogy of Israel here. He provides a genealogy of the nations. Why? Because that's his ultimate goal. God's big picture here is not just one nation or one plot of land. God ever has his eye on all the nations. God's layout here, God's scope, God's story is bigger than just one little piece of land in the Middle East. God is setting up a worldwide chessboard in Genesis 10. Why? Because that's how big his plan is, worldwide. This reminds us that the end goal of what God is seeking to do is not just one nation, but the nations. This story is bigger than you think. There is a phenomenal book written by uh, the Christian theologian and philosopher Augustine. It's this big. It's, it's called The City of God. And he wrote it in the early 400s after the sack of Rome. Rome had been this mighty empire of the world. They had been like iron crushing all foes for hundreds of years. And when Rome fell to the barbarians, all the people of Rome said, what are we going to do? The, the, the mightiest nation in the world has fallen. It's almost like history itself is going to come to an end. And Augustine wrote his book, The City of God, to encourage believers that God's plan is not limited to one city or even one nation. God's worldwide plan is just that, worldwide. And we cannot restrict it to one place, one kingdom, or even one people group. God's plan is for all people. And you know what I find really interesting here is that all three of these groups, it says that they spread out based on four categories, land, language, clans, and nation. There's a fourfold division here. They're divided by their land, their language, their clans, and their nations. What I do find interesting is that there's no mention of race the way that we think of it. In fact, our understanding of race as just separating people by skin color, that's a fairly modern innovation. But when you read the Bible, it places, and there was a lot of people with a lot of skin tones coming in and out of the story in the Bible. There's very little attention given to the color of someone's skin. That's a fairly modern invention. You might have somebody who lived in Israel. They could have been very dark. They could have been very light. You could have someone who could be from Greece or even from somewhere else where they're very dark or very light. Totally dependent. What, what they recognized, how people were classified was not by something as superficial as skin color. It was more about where they lived, the language they spoke, their family groupings, and how those people came together to form nations. And so it's not a bad thing that God has created all these different diverse cultures, people who share languages and culture. That's, that's a beautiful thing. As long as we don't stay so isolated that we think my group is better than that other group. My group is closer to God than this other group. God's plan is always bigger. It's always the nations. The sixth thing to look at this morning is that God's big story unfolds over a long period of time. The story of the Bible does not jump from Genesis 1 right to Revelation 22, does it? There's a whole lot of stuff that happens in between, and it takes place over a long period of time. How long do you think it took these ancient peoples coming from one location— 
which, by the way, even you could talk to somebody who believes in, in Darwinian evolution, someone who's a staunch atheist, and even they would admit that humanity comes from one source and spread out over the globe. Right? So that, that's, that's pretty well established. But how long do you think it would take a, pe a group of people on foot, these are in the, the good old days, you know, before planes, trains, and automobiles, how long do you think it would take them to head out with all their children and their families and their animals and spread across the entire globe. A long time. We read about it in one little condensed chapter here. You guys who listened to it said, that wasn't little, that was a long time. But in the big scheme of things, this takes years and years and years to come about. Now, we live in an age of instant gratification. Everything has got to be immediate. I don't know if anybody here remembers back in the days of this thing called dial-up. Remember when you wanted to get on the internet and you couldn't just click a button, you had to like connect to a phone line and then you had to wait for the wee -wee -wee little, little noise to ring up for you. And then when you wanted to go to a web page, it would take like five minutes to load. All right, anybody remember that? Stone Age stuff, isn't it? Because now everything's got to be right away. Now, I don't know if anybody remembers back in the day when you were watching a show, you had to wait a whole week till the next episode. You couldn't just binge all 20 episodes in one fell swoop. You had to actually do this thing called wait. We're a Cliff Notes generation. If I want to know about a book, I don't read the book. I just go and I read it somewhere on Wikipedia. Right? Everything just has to be so quick and, and right now. We love microwavable dinners. We love get-rich-quick schemes. We love the weight loss pills that promise you can lose 50 pounds in one week. Forget about hard work, persistence, patience. Just do it now instantly. But this big story God is telling, this is not a cliff note story. It takes time. Jesus compared to the spread of the kingdom of God to a tiny little mustard seed that would have to grow gradually. He compared it to a little bit of yeast that would have to make its way through the entire batch of dough. It feels really long to us. I know some of us, we might be in a period of waiting where it feels like it's taking forever. And you think, God, when will the end ever come? When will I finally get over this part of my life, this chapter in the story? It's taking too long. But we can be comforted in realizing that this big story God is writing is sprawling. We're not going to come to the end of it until Jesus returns. It takes time to develop. We are right now in the season of the story being written out. We will always be in this transit until Christ comes and makes all things new. This should fill us with faithfulness and patience. It should fill us with faithfulness because, Christian, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what struggles you have in your life. I don't know where Satan is tempting you to give up your responsibilities. I don't know where you might be having to commit to doing the right thing. And it is laborious. It is tiresome. It is weighing on your mind. It's weighing on your body. It's weighing on your soul. And you want to throw in the towel. You want to give up. You want to say, God, when will I just come to the end of the chapter? And realizing that this big story unfolds over a long period of time, equips us with the resolve to say, I need to stay faithful to my post. I need to stay faithful to what God has given me to do, knowing he is working out this story. And we can do so with patience, trusting that the author, just as he was faithful to put all the nations exactly where he wanted them, he will be faithful to bring this story to its, its conclusion in its proper time. And that brings us to our final observation this morning, that God's big story culminates in the work and person of Jesus Christ. Look with me in Revelation chapter 5. Turn with me there. In Revelation chapter 5, we read that the Apostle John beholds this scroll on which God has written his plan for the world. He says it's written on the front and on the back, and it's sealed with seven seals. And verse 2 says, I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly. There was no one found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. Here John beholds the scroll of God's plan for the world. The, you might call this scroll the big story. This is basically God's book. This is the story God has been writing. 
This is the big story. And John beholds it, and it's sealed. And the, the, the cry, the challenge is given out, kind of like the, the sword in the stone at Camelot. Somebody come on up, try your best at, at taking it out of, the, out of the stone. Who is worthy? Who can come unseal it and bring about God's plan? Who is going to be faithful? Who is able? Who is mighty enough to bring about all that God is going to do in the world? And no one can be found. Not the mightiest angel, not the most brilliant cherubim, not the strongest of kings. Nobody is worthy. And John is weeping. He's saying, how will this story ever come to completion? How will all of our longings and all of our desires and all of our hopes, will they just be dashed on the rocks of failure? Or will anyone ever be able to bring this story to its conclusion? And then one of the elders says to him in verse 5, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, is conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can come and can bring this story to its conclusion, who through his life, death, resurrection, ascension, and through his return and reign will pilot this plane exactly where God wants it to go. And I think it's really interesting. Look with me in verse 10. It says, oh, I'm sorry, not verse 10. Um, yeah, it's verse 10. I apologize about that. It says <laughs> in, uh, in chapter 5, verse 10, you've got this worship going on. And it says, Verse, guys, I'm sorry, it's verse 9. I was looking at chapter 4. I'm like, where is this verse? I know it's here, but it's actually uh, verse 9. They sing a new song saying to Jesus, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. You remember in Genesis 10, remember how it divided humanity into four categories? Here we've got the four categories again. And it says of those four categories, Jesus, the Lamb, by your blood, you have redeemed, you have ransomed, you have brought these nations back together in your blood. And so what Genesis 10 does here is it continues the messianic story and it sets all the pieces in place, including Israel. As God puts all these nations in their land, that's going to include the nation of Israel. And it's from Israel that the Messiah would be born. And when the Messiah is born in Israel, it then becomes the springboard by which this good news of redemption goes out into all the world. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11 says, In that day the root of Jesse, Jesus, will stand as a signal for the peoples. Of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Matthew 28, 18 and 19, Before Jesus ascended, he sent out his disciples, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of what? Of all nations. Israel is positioned in their land, as are all the other nations, so that the Messiah, the Lamb, the Lion, can come from Israel, just like God promised, and through Him, all the nations would then be brought in. And so the last thing we're going to look at this morning, we're still in Revelation, look at Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 12. John says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number. From every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. There's that fourfold division again. All the nations of Genesis 10, you've got representatives from every single one of those groups here. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. Jesus is the one who brings all these nations under one banner, under the kingdom of God, by the blood of the Lamb. And as we've considered all these things, this, this is a, a long chapter. It's a chapter with words that are really hard to pronounce. It's a chapter that in our devotion we might skip over but hopefully it should give us a little bit of insight into the bigness of this story that God is writing, what it means for us, and how it's come to culmination 
in Jesus Christ. And what our response should be is what we see here in Revelation 7. Worship of the Lamb. All of this is designed to increase our adoration and our praise for Jesus who has brought it all together and has made it complete. Church, as we go forward this week, may we only ever find our right place in the story by realizing that it is God's story. God is the one telling it. God will be faithful to bring it to its conclusion. And God is indeed making all things new. Jesus Christ.